Hey everyone, Will here. So for today's video, we are going to be analyzing the Pullman strike. That means we're going to be going over all aspects of this labor strike, including the details that led up to this event, the details during this event, and the details at the end of this event. So without further ado, let's begin. So the Pullman strike consisted of two 1894 labor boycott movements led by the American Railway Union, which halted rail traffic and commerce in 27 states. These boycotts were primarily enacted in an attempt to protest stagnant wages and rising rent costs for the Pullman workers that lived in the town of Pullman, Illinois. So the story behind the Pullman strike begins back in 1865. At this time, American industrialists George Pullman and Ben Field invented the Pullman sleeper car, a railway passenger car that was designed for comfortable nighttime travel for upper middle class Americans. After the assassination of U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, the federal government chose to use the Pullman sleeper car for the last leg of the funeral train, leading to the renovation of every station and bridge between Chicago and Springfield. The publicity gained from this event turned the Pullman sleeper car into an immediate commercial success. Using the millions of dollars earned from his business venture, George Pullman established his own town that was near the Pullman Palace Car Company factory. Pullman then established behavioral standards that workers had to meet to live in the area while also charging his workers rent. George Pullman and his architect, Salon Spencer Beeman, made sure to keep everything within a small vicinity in order to ensure that goods and services were within close proximity to his workers. The row houses that were built in Pullman, Illinois were comfortable for the standards of that time, having important appliances such as indoor plumbing, gas, and sewers. While the town's services were adequate, stores and housing in the area were operated exclusively by Pullman. This gave George Pullman an effective monopoly over his new town. Pullman also controlled freedom of the press in the town, which showcased another major problem in the new neighborhood. Later on, the situation got worse during the Panic of 1893, a major economic crisis that caused a decrease in demand for the Pullman passenger and freight cars. In response to this decrease in demand, the Pullman company laid off hundreds of workers while also reducing total worker income. While wages decreased, Pullman kept the cost of rent the same. This meant that workers at the Pullman Palace Car Company had significantly less income than they had in prior years, while their overhead costs, such as rent, remained stagnant. Despite the concerns being raised, Pullman refused to engage in any type of negotiation or collective bargaining with his workers. On May 11, 1894, all 4,000 employees of the Pullman Palace Car Company engaged in a wildcat strike, which is a work boycott that is undertaken by employees without the consent of a representing union. They engaged in this type of strike since none of the 4,000 employees of Pullman's company belonged to a union that they could rely upon for aid. The main grievances of the striking workers included the absence of democracy in the politics of the Pullman town, the rigid paternalistic controls over workers by the Pullman Company, high water and gas rates, and a refusal by the Pullman Company to let workers buy and own houses in the area. Shortly after the strike had begun, the American Railway Union, led by Eugene Debs, offered their support to striking Pullman workers. On June 26, 1894, Eugene Debs organized a new boycott instructing American Railway Union members to boycott any trains using Pullman cars. By this time, about 35% of Pullman employees were members of the American Railway Union. Eugene Debs hoped that this national boycott would pressure Pullman to make a compromise with his workers. Four days after the start of the boycott, over 125,000 workers on 29 railroads had walked off the job rather than work with Pullman cars. From June 26th to July 20th, rail service abruptly stopped due to the nationwide boycott. This caused numerous problems for the economy since railroads were the primary means for transporting goods. 
In response to this crisis, railroads began hiring strike breakers, or replacement workers, for these jobs. Many of these strike breakers were African American, who didn't feel welcomed by the American Railway Union. This fueled a lot of racial tension between the striking workers and the strike breakers. As tensions grew, strike breakers were sometimes violently attacked by some of the striking workers. On June 29, 1894, Eugene Debs hosted a rally at Blue Island, Illinois to bring more attention to the issues that were behind the Pullman workers' strike. He did this in hopes of putting more pressure on the Pullman company to meet the strikers' demands. After the rally ended, violence broke out, with several rogue strikers setting fire to nearby buildings while also managing to derail a nearby train. In response to increased pressure from the American people, U.S. President Grover Cleveland demanded that the trains begin transporting goods and mail again. Eugene Debs and the American Railway Union responded to Cleveland by refusing to call off the strike until the demands of the Pullman strikers were met. On July 2, 1894, U.S. Attorney General Richard Olney received an injunction or a court order from Circuit Court Judges Peter S. Grosskopf and William Allen Woods that prohibited American Railway Union officials from compelling or encouraging any railroad employees to refuse or fail to perform their job-related duties. Illinois Governor John Peter Altgeld became a prominent critic of the federal court injunction, arguing that the injunction was not justified under the Sherman Act. In his own words, Altgeld stated, This decision marks a turning point in our history, for it establishes a new form of government never before heard of among men, that is, government by injunction. Under this new order of things, a federal judge becomes at once a legislator, court, and executioner. Attorney General Olney's action was notable since it marked the first time in U.S. history that an injunction was used to end a strike. This action gave the U.S. federal government the legal authority to intervene in a strike. Both Eugene Debs and leaders of the American Railway Union refused to recognize the federal court injunction. As the physical and economic damage began to intensify, President Cleveland began to lose confidence in Illinois Governor John Peter Altgeld's ability to manage the strike. Cleveland believed that federal intervention was necessary to deal with the strike, while Governor Altgeld favored using the state militia to rein in the violence. On July 3, 1894, President Cleveland ordered thousands of federal troops to enforce the federal court injunction. In response to the deployment of U.S. troops, Eugene Debs called on the American Railway Union members to peacefully disobey the federal court injunction and to ignore the federal troops, stating, Strong men and broad minds only can resist the plutocracy and arrogant monopoly. Do not be frightened at troops, injunctions, or a subsidized press. Quit and remain firm. Commit. No violence. The American Railway Union will protect all, whether members or not, when strike is off. At first, Eugene Debs believed that the U.S. military would allow the strike and the boycott to continue peacefully. However, the U.S. military was not just present to break up violence, they were also there to ensure that the trains ran, which severely weakened the American Railway Union's boycott. Traveling to several major U.S. cities, thousands of U.S. Marshals and 12,000 U.S. troops, led by U.S. Brigadier General Nelson Miles prevented the American Railway Union attempts to boycott the national transportation system. On July 4, 1894, Pullman strikers had overturned rail cars and built barricades that prevented U.S. troops from reaching the rail yards. On July 6, thousands of protesters set hundreds of rail cars on fire at the south end of Chicago. On July 7, U.S. National Guard troops fired at defying Pullman strikers, killing 30 of the striking workers and wounding many more. After three days of violence, Eugene Debs and leaders of the American Railway Union called for an end to the Pullman strike. All across the country, trains began moving on the railroads again. 
By July 20th, all U.S. federal troops in Chicago were withdrawn. The Pullman Palace Car Company agreed to rehire striking workers under the condition that none of them join a union again. Eugene Debs and the leaders of the Pullman strike were arrested and sent to prison under the charges of conspiracy to obstruct mail service and for defying orders that were issued by the U.S. Supreme Court. Eugene Debs spent six months in prison in the aftermath of the Pullman strike. After months of reading letters, books, and pamphlets while in federal prison, Eugene Debs finally became committed to the socialist cause. In 1897, Eugene Debs founded an organization known as the Social Democracy of America, which sought to establish itself as a voice for the rights of low-wage workers in America. In the aftermath of the Pullman strike, it was estimated that 30 people were killed in riots throughout Chicago, while another 40 people were killed in riots elsewhere in the United States. It is also estimated that the violence that occurred during the strike led to approximately $80 million in property damage. Adjusted for inflation, this $80 million would be equivalent to over $2 billion in property damage today. While the Pullman strike was popular with railroad workers who were members of the American Railway Union, it was largely unpopular with engineers, firemen, and conductors who worked on the railroads. Media coverage of the Pullman strike was generally negative. News reports and published editorials often portrayed the strikers as foreigners who challenged the patriotism expressed by militias and troops involved in stopping the strike. Although these stereotypes were oftentimes published, the truth was that many of the low-wage factory and railroad workers who were immigrants simply hoped to earn a higher wage for their work. Another major criticism of the strike was the social unrest that was taking place across Chicago and other major cities. Published editorials often warned of mobs, anarchy, and social unrest taking place across major American cities. President Cleveland was also highly critical of the American Railway Union for not complying with the federal court injunction that was issued. Meanwhile, among religious groups in Chicago, many older church leaders denounced the strike, while some younger Protestant ministers defended it. Although the Pullman strike ultimately failed, Labor unions did score a victory when President Cleveland officially recognized Labor Day as a federal holiday. Legislation for the holiday was pushed through Congress six days after the strike had ended, receiving a great deal of support, even among those who had opposed the Pullman strike. Additionally, even though the Pullman strike was not a total success, it did cause President Cleveland to appoint a national commission to study the causes for the strike. The commission found that George Pullman's company town was un-American. In 1898, the Illinois Supreme Court took the findings a step farther when they forced the Pullman Company to divest ownership in the town, as its company charter did not authorize such operations. The land of the Pullman town was then annexed to the city of Chicago. Today, much of the town has been designated as historic district, being listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Overall, the Pullman strike was a major event in United States history that showcased the growing divide between big businesses and the working class in the Gilded Age. Thank you for checking out our video. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more additional content. If you have any ideas for a future video topic, please leave a comment and let me know what you would like to see me cover next. I'm really hoping to grow this channel and provide you all with more content in the future, and your support means the world to me. Thanks everyone!